Let me begin with a political note and let me say that for some time Nehru uh, uh, has been a kind of a favorite whipping boy both in the academia and also in the political circles. We are going through a phase of kind of Nehru bashing. Nehru is being blamed for everything that has gone wrong with Indian polity and society. The slow pace of economic growth till 1991, Nehru is blamed for it. Poor relations with Pakistan, Jawaharlal Nehru is blamed for it. China war of 1962, Jawaharlal Nehru is blamed for it. The Kashmir problem, whenever it comes up, Nehru is blamed for it. The policy of non-alignment, our, and it is said that we antagonize both America and Russia, they were both unhappy with us, Nehru is blamed for it. The limitations of our democracy, Nehru is blamed for it. Problems with our secularism, problems with our nationalism. In short, whatever, whatever problem, big problem you can think of, there is one culprit for everything and that culprit is Jawaharlal Nehru. Why is that so? I have a brief explanation for this Nehru bashing. My explanation is that Nehru was at the helm of affairs during two very crucial phases of Indian history. And he was, has been called a rebel and a statesman. In the first phase, during the national movement, he was a rebel. He was a leader of an anti-imperialist struggle. And in the second phase, he was the statesman. He was the leader. He was the prime minister of the country. Now, in both these phases, let us say first phase was 1920 to 47, and second phase was since 47 to 1964. This is an extremely important, virtually an axial period in India's history. If you want to understand India, this is the period. Now, it is during this period that Nehru was really at the helm of affairs. As a result of which, what he is considered responsible for whatever wrong that happened. Because if something wrong that happened during this period, then it's easy to identify the culprit, which is Nehru. Now, my job today is not to defend Nehru because fortunately I am sitting in a community of admirers of Nehru and not Nehru bashers. If I was sitting in some other community, I would try and defend him. I am not trying to defend Nehru today. But merely to say that some of this blame on Nehru is misplaced, some is based on a misreading of history, and some of it is politically motivated. It suits some people to create a villain, and that villain is Jawaharlal Nehru. My job today, as I said, is to discuss the important relevance of Nehru, his contribution to the building of India and his, the relevance of that effort today. And for the sake of clarity and brevity, I have identified six such contributions. So I'll actually be talking about six areas or six major contributions that Nehru made all of which are important even today. So the stamp of that is, you can see, even today. So let me quickly start. One, I mean, I'll just do one, two, three, four, five. And in these six, I will also make a kind of a criticism of Nehru. And, and then I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end my talk. I'll take about 40 minutes or so. My, I think the first major contribution of Jawaharlal Nehru was that he provided a social content to Indian nationalism. And he did it by introducing the question of class into the debate on nationalism. And he was one of the first to do it. He was probably the first to do it. Let me explain what I mean. When Indian nationalism developed in the late 19th century, it was like a shell. There was nothing inside it. There was a kind of an outline a community of Indian people, Indian people having common interests, all of them being together. But on what kind of basis? There was a shell without the substance. Now Nehru provides the substance. And how does he provide the substance? In the 1920s, he provides the substance to Indian nationalism by raising two important questions. First question, this is the time when the British were ruling India. First question he says is that what is the meaning of freedom? 
are we is freedom merely the indianization of the existing structure if the british were to go and indians were to replace british would that be the meaning of freedom and of course he said no freedom is not just the indianization of the same structure but freedom is to fight for a very entirely different structure all over again in which people will have a say and the second question that he raised and he was one of the first to raise it freedom for whom he said indian society is one nation but not all the people at the are at the same level within the indian society there are the predators and there are the prey there are the dominant people and there are the dominated people there are the capitalists and the workers there are the landlords and the peasants and he said the real freedom will be when freedom will mean something for the peasants and the workers